Hi, I'm Norma Elia Cantu. I'm the Markison Professor in the Humanities at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I'm going to be reading a paper, uh, Dancing for La Virgen de Guadalupe, the Matachines in Kansas City. And it is a part of a larger project that I worked on with Brenda Romero, the ethnomusicologist, professor of ethnomusicology. And uh, we visited Kansas City to do the research, the field work in 2017. So um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the spirits of our ancestors and where we are, wherever we are listening to this, just acknowledge those that came before us, ask permission and thank you giving gratitude for those of you who are here, for Adam, who has in the Vatican worked to make this conference happen. Thank you so much. And um, I begin. My uh, co-collaborator, Brenda Romero, and I visited Kansas City in 2017 in December. We were doing work on a project for the Benamerita, Universidad Benamerita, Autónoma de Puebla, the BOAP, and they were doing research on Matachines in the United States. For this project, I would like to focus on Kansas City, although we also visited sites in Arizona, Texas, and in New Mexico. First, a few words about my use of the term borderlands. The term transfrontera as well can be confusing or un un not recognized. For our purposes, we define the borderlands following Don Americo Paredes' claim that wherever the Mexican community exists, we find what he called Greater Mexico. Following his claim and including Gloria Ansaldúa's notion of the borderlands, we posit the idea that the border must be perceived as conceptual in nature and that wherever Mexican origin people meet, there a borderlands exists. A confluence of the two bordering cultures as they clash and come together to form a new space, what Anzaldúa would have called Nepantla. We hold that the U.S.-Mexico border has gradually moved with immigrant populations into other areas of the United States. As these migrant populations deterritorialize from their home communities, carry their culture with them and create new cultural spaces as Daniel Arriola, the cultural geographer, has noted in his study of Garfield, Arizona, a Mexican immigrant neighborhood where transformations to residential landscapes have already, um, have altered, excuse me, existing community spaces to Latino cultural spaces. We noted in our research that the Matachin tradition uh, immigrant groups add to the diversity of traditions. That is, whereas in Laredo, Texas, for example, all the Matachines groups are from the same origin and have similar steps, music, and dress, that is not so in Kansas City. With immigrants coming to Kansas City from different areas, the Mexican Matachin tradition complements, for example, in New Mexico, the Hispano and Pueblo native ceremonial and religious danza. Variants that in New Mexico, as well as in all of greater Mexico, include Chicano dance troops that may dance variants of this, of this tradition. We quickly realized upon arriving that how much more research we needed to do to understand the full scope of Manatines troops currently active in the United States, both immigrant and groups that are autochthonous to greater Mexico, to the Me greater Mexico regions as they have been there since before 1848. Our fieldwork and research of how cultural practices shift and get and yet remain the same begins with Kansas City. In December 2017, we arrived in the area to observe the initial prayer cycles of the 12 or nine day preceding the actual feast day on the feast day of our Virgin of Guadalupe, December 12th. The Kansas City metropolitan area is home to over 200,000 inhabitants who identify 
as Latinx, Chicanx, Chicano, Mexican-American, Mexican, Raza, perhaps Latina and Latino, and other terms. Mexican migration to the region began in the late 19th century, coming mostly from Mexico and Texas since um, the 1890s to the present day, lured by the promise of jobs. Mexican and other Latino immigrants have settled in the Kansas City area and brought their traditions with them. Traditions that came from their place of origin, first Texas and California, now from all over the country of Mexico, Central America, and Mesoamerica in general. We documented the existence of 10 Matachin troops and witnessed seven of these dancing in, in the larger combined metropolitan area spanning Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. We observed that a variety of different Matachin types uh, that emerged in Michoacan, Chihuahua, Durango, for the most part, but also Texas and California have found a home, a niche, if you will, for the tradition in the area. All the groups call themselves Matachines, in contrast to Matlachines, that uh, groups that Romero witnessed in Aguascalientes in May with the same BWAP academic cohort. When I was a professor at UMKC, uh, at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, I scouted potential traditional folklife field sites, including parishes where urban mestizas and mestizos congregate to dance matachin. My contacts at UMKC helped me, contacts that included uh, students and other friends. When we arrived in December, however, um, I had lost some of these contacts. It had been four years since I had been there or since I had done the work. Most of the troops provide their own, um, most of the parishes, excuse me, in the region have groups of matachines. However, some parishes invite groups from others because they do not have a resident troop. The, the churches where we visited have their own and then other groups come in uh, as well. We made phone calls, we posted on social media, we set up visits to the sites where the groups were to dance at both um, All Saints Church and St. John the Evangelist. We also set up face-to-face -face meetings for interviews with the dirigentes, the leaders of the troops. First, I'll talk about All Saints Church. It's a church that began as a Polish Catholic church and the group there, um, the church itself was known previously as St. Cyrilo or Cyril. It had served a predominantly Polish population, but it is currently serving a predominantly Latina, Latino faith-based population. Served by various priests, including Vicar Father Efren Aguilar, the church offers masses in English and Spanish, and their website reflects the bilinguality and shows vestiges of its past. At this church, we witnessed Danza Reina de Mexico, Danza San Judas Tadeo, and Danza Guadalupana, three main groups in the Kansas City area. On the, on the evening of December 2nd, they had gathered for a rehearsal, but actually to be part of what they call the docenario, that is for 12 days before the 12th, they will dance every night. Some groups only dance for nine days before the, the feast. We requested permission from the apparent leaders, being having talked to church secretary Blanca Cumbea, who led us to the community leaders who organized the dance groups and the events leading up to the December 12th celebration. We videotaped the photographs for almost three hours of dancing nonstop. We chatted with a number of participants from the various groups, including one of my former students from the UMKC, who informed me that the people I had worked with before, especially one of the students, had left and was back in Mexico. I had interviewed this young dancer the year before and had attended dancing at a restaurant and the procession to the church in 2015. After the dancing concluded around 11 p.m., we talked to the dirigente and agreed we would call and set up a follow-up 
date and time, conduct more in-depth interviews, and we did. But when we returned to the, at the appointed time, two nights later, Vicar Afren Aguilar, flanked by two armed security guards, met us and did not allow us to conduct the follow-up interviews. Father Aguilar insisted that we needed to secure permission from the bishop in the diocesan office before we could conduct any further interviews of the dancers. Since it was a weekend and we were only in town for a couple of days, the request was impossible to secure. However, we took the names and intended to follow up, if at all possible, uh, on the phone. Of course, we had already taken many photographs with permission from the community organizers, one of them the woman who had agreed to meet with us and who was the liaison to all the groups. She stood by passively, obviously embarrassed during our conversation with Vika Aguilar. She was not allowed to speak with us. Often dancers may encounter obstacles and in 2017, we found this was one of them. We also found out that the procession, which had been a basic element previous years, had been canceled because the permit was not secured. Apparently, it was due to a political shift and the new municipal government had not been as open or flexible with deadlines as in the past. Instead of a long procession from a restaurant on Central Avenue, Uh, um, a main thoroughfare, the procession, in quotes, had been reduced to a few yards around the ground, the church grounds. The organizers seemed to blame themselves for not having had the foresight to solicit the permit with plenty of time and spoke of how next year they will begin planning earlier. Now the second site, Sacred Heart Church in Argentine, Kansas. This second site we had been to before. I contacted collaborators and we met with Virginia Oropesa and other groups at St. John the Apostle Catholic Church. We conducted interviews, took photos, videotaped dancers and participants in one-on-one -on -one interviews. The neighborhood known as Argentine and the area where the settlers who came to work in the railroad first settled is home to many longtime residents of the region, as well as some newly migrated Mexican origin people from California and Texas and various states of Mexico. We spoke to Oropesa with whom I had worked with earlier documenting the Oropesa's daughter's quinceañera and uh, Virginia's Christmas traditions that included nacimientos before. Among those we interviewed were two sisters who came from California 30 years ago. They spoke of having worked alongside Cesar Chavez and of their current challenge. One of them spoke of how she had had a kidney transplant and was dancing to give thanks to the Virgen de Guadalupe for having given her help. This is a very common experience. Many of the dancers dance in Thanksgiving for health reasons. Now a description. The various dances, the matachines we observed in Kansas City have been together for a long time, ranging from five to over 20, 25, even 30 years. Other than that one group of women only danzantes, the troops are all inclusive and include men, women, children, as well as adults in a communitarian style typical of indigenous societies of North America, in contrast to versions comprised strictly of adult men who in part seek atonement and redemption for sins through self-sacrifice via the dance. In many instances, the groups had at one time been male only, but through time have become um, more inclusive. The danza cannot be underestimated as a form of spiritual self-development that also brings better health on its practitioners and to thousands of small communities across Mexico and the United States. A faith-based religious expression, the danza de matachines survives along with other folk Catholic traditional expressions that include folk saints, folk healing practices, textiles, of course, um, practices for around liturgical holidays like Easter and Christmas. 
In analyzing the Matachines in a religious context, we find that they integrate elements, including previously that previously mentioned, the novena or docenario, where there are prayer vigils for 12 days or nine days preceding the day of December 12th. It includes processions, masses, a rosary for each of the nine or 12 days, and dances. Embodied in expressive hybrid forms of prayer and supplications with roots in ancient um, Mesoamerican tradition as well as Iberia or Spain. The choreological aspects include the following uh, consistencies and patterns. First, each dance group is comprised of two lines of danzantes of varying numbers led by two leaders, sometimes called capitanes, and two at the end of the line, sometimes called mayordomo. In the all-female group, it is usually the older females who take these positions, while in the mixed groups, it is generally male dancers, often including the leader or dirigente of the group. Two, the choreography is a basic style that Romero has documented and that Cantu documents in the Laredo Matachines de la Ladrillera, who, by the way, received the National Heritage Award from the National Endowment for the Arts this year. That is a group of Matachines I've been working with for over 25 years in the Laredo, Texas area. The dancers, number three, dancers enter in procession and at the entrance into the church is more of a combination of elements that evoke the sound of heart rain, as in the video examples I will provide later. The procession and the entrada are tunes specifically selected for that. The same thing happens at the end. Next, in December, the groups that we observed began with a danza that had a salutation, an entrada or reverencia to the Virgin of Guadalupe. In some instances, the groups will dance for other saints and therefore it will be a different image. But in this case, they were dancing for the Virgen de Guadalupe. The dances or sones have names and are sequential. For example, for Danza Reina de Mexico, the troupe that we observed and documented, it is led by a man of mostly female dancers. The following sones comprise the presentation. Entrada, reverencia. Media Vuelta, Cuatro, Vuelta Completa, Diamante, and Salida. That is entrance, reverence, half circle, four step, full circle, diamond, and exit. There are many other sones with different names and choreographies depending on the troop's skill level. This is consistent with findings in Rincón de Ramos in Aguascalientes, Mexico, and in Laredo, Texas, where the Matachín fiddlers who know that most sones are revered and are not only, always the oldest fiddlers around. Nonetheless, none of the Matachines variants that we witnessed in Kansas City use the violin, and they espouse Mexican autochthonous roots to their variants. According to Mexican ethnomusicologist Jose Luis Sagrado Castillo, this idea comes from the friendship the Spaniards cultivated with the Tlaxcaltecan group, without whom they could not have defended defeated the Aztecs. This resulted in exemptions from tributes and a greater fluidity in training refinements that with Tlaxcaltecan royalty. And that seems to have preserved rare and unique art forms that developed in traditions like Danza de los Quetzales, Danza de los Pachles, and Danza de los Hueves, and others that also use castanets in their Matachines-like settings. In terms of footwear, most of the danzantes in Kansas City wore a kind of leather sandal, huarache, that uses nails to hold the soles together as well as to create sound when the sandal is brushed on the floor. Some use laminated soles for this sound effect. Because Kansas City is so cold in December and the danzantes are in procession up to an hour or longer, some of them will wear tennis shoes or cowboy boots. The capitanes, the captains, repeat the same choreography or pisada three times, each time more complicated and demanding. The danzantes follow. 
finally observed in the danza at All Saints Church, each troop takes its turn dancing in front of the makeshift altar with the Virgin de Guadalupe, Our Lady of Guadalupe. As one group ends its repertoire, the capitanes hand over the danza as the next group enters and starts dancing. All the while dancing, the two troops meet and salute each other as one exits and the new group proceeds to the reverencia. We saw this repeatedly over and over. As one group is exiting, the next group is welcome, greeted, and it's passed on to them. About the dance regalia, we can say that most troops use the nahuilla, y chaleco, the skirt and vest. Although we observe more than one variant, most of the ceremonial mat matachines regalia in Kansas City consist of a typically yellow or red, but colors vary shirt or blouse underneath an embroidered vest with ties along the sides. The danzantes wear similarly colored stockings or trousers underneath their nahuilla or two flap skirt, also lavishly embroidered with images of Our Lady of Guadalupe that drop over the lower part of the body, also with ties, ribbons or pom-poms along the sides. The nahuilla is embroidered and decorated with rows of string carrizo reed pieces forming a kind of fringe. It's a kind of bamboo that has been cut. Due to the scarcity of this bamboo reed in the area, the dancers now use plastic substitutions more readily found in local hobby stores. The sound does not seem to suffer from the substitution. This is not the case, however, in Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, Texas, where the dancers have substituted the carrizo with plastic straws this happened when the supply of Carrizo was cut short by Homeland Security clearing the land along the riverbank where the Carrizo grows and where the Matachines had harvested it. Fringe is a common symbolic petition for water among North American indigenous peoples. And in the dry region of North Mexico, in addition to the gourd rattles, the fringe also mimics the sound of hard rain falling, as is evident from the video clip that I will show later. Like um, to priming a pump, this sound is a form of sympathetic magic meant to attract the real thing, rain. The use of Carrizo is not surprising as the indigenous people of the northern Mexican states of Tamaulipas, Nuevo Leon, Chihuahua, and Coahuila and South Texas region belong to the Coahuiltecan group, an indigenous group that covers this large vast area and includes one particular group called Carrizo. Diversity of tradition and images, and I'll show you a video. The various traditions that we witnessed are testament to the diversity in the danza, both Mexico in, in the US and in Mexico. While most adhere to the Carrizo Matachines in dress and in sones, including the music and dance steps, the contrast is undeniable as many hail from farther south into central Mexico, like Michoacán. The different types of matachin events we witnessed in Kansas City was truly interesting. I'll give you um, the various types below. And here are our ethnomusicological observations, and this is what we found. One to three bass drums are generally used. And of course, the more drums, the louder the sound. Cane, French and jingle bells on the regalia form part of the land soundscape associated with matachines. Rhythmic footwork with special shoes, huaraches, are also used as part of the soundscape. The drums follow the dance steps and the capitanes and mayordomo signal the dance steps to the entire troop. The purepecha women played the instrumental banda pieces via a laptop in the church PA system. Overlapping danzas and rhythms establish complicated sonic worlds. And I'll stop here and go ahead and show you the video. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, just give me a minute here. I think I'm going to have to open it first. 
And here it is. And there we go. Okay, so you get the idea. The first group was actually a group from uh, Michoacan, and uh, the second group is uh, a one more traditional, the one that I was describing earlier. Both groups and the others uh, dance in the churches, but they also dance in their home spaces, and uh, especially for the 12 days prior to the celebration. And I think I'll stop here. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you and presenting this work. It's an ongoing project. I have been doing the work on Matachinas for a long time. I'm working on a book. And I'm still not sure how I'm going to integrate the research from Kansas City because my book is focused on the border in Texas. But it's really an honor to be here and participating. And I hope that this piece on the Matachines has given you some insight as to the tradition there in the area. Uh, by the way, that last uh, church was not either one of the ones that I talked about. This one was in um, uh, on the west side. It's called Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. And it is one of the oldest ones. It's been there since around 1900, where they have had Matachines ongoing for almost as long. I haven't documented any that early, but I know they were there in the 50s and 60s. And there was one group that came to that church 50 years ago, and they have been dancing every year since then. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.